Well, hello, zonographers everywhere, and welcome to another episode. Shooting with an old manual film camera is a great way to learn photography. Master manual photography and you'll have complete control over the images you make. But manual photography has its limits and it's not ideal for every situation or indeed for every photographer. Shooting in auto exposure is often much quicker and easier than shooting in manual. And just because we can shoot manual doesn't mean we have to. So I've got together five of the best auto exposure film cameras that you can buy today. They cost from around £40 to around £120. So they're all fairly affordable too. They aren't the only auto exposure film cameras available, but I think they're some of the nicest. So we'll begin with one of the most iconic film cameras ever made, and that's the Olympus Trip 35. This camera was aimed at the consumer market, and in its day, it was a very popular camera indeed. It was advertised on TV by no less a luminary than David Bailey, and they sold in the millions. But it wasn't just advertising that sold them. They sold because they were an excellent little camera. And it's still a sweet little machine today. It's a very small and light camera, and because it's so discreet and non-threatening, it makes a great street photography camera. It has a leaf shutter which is almost silent, so I don't think anybody would be scared or intimidated by it. It has a 40mm lens, which is just what you want in a camera of this type. For general photography, a 50mm can sometimes be a bit too long, and a 35 can be a bit too wide, so 40mm is a good compromise. And this lens is a really nice one. It's an Olympus Suico design with a maximum aperture of f2.8, so it gives very high quality, very sharp images. Focusing is pretty simple too, with three positions on the lens barrel for near, about three feet or one meter, medium and far. This camera has only two shutter speeds, one fortieth and one two hundredth of a second, but a wide range of aperture settings. One of the best things about this camera is that it doesn't need any batteries. The exposure meter is a selenium cell mounted around the lens behind this very 60s looking plastic cover. Don't be put off by stories of selenium cells dying and losing accuracy. In my experience, they work accurately for many, many years and they're not inherently unreliable. This camera will work wherever and whenever you want. You can set the aperture manually on this camera, but it's probably best used in fully auto mode, leaving the photographer free to concentrate on composition. In auto, this camera is an absolute breeze to use. It's almost as easy as a phone camera, and it gives really fantastic results. As far as price goes, these cameras are great value. There are one or two versions that are prized by collectors, but most of these cameras go for somewhere between 40 and 60 pounds, sometimes less. A great way to shoot some film that won't break the bank. The Olympus OM10 is a 1980s consumer SLR that will give you plenty of bang for your buck. It shoots in aperture priority only, which means that the photographer sets the aperture and the camera selects the corresponding shutter speed. Personally, I think this is all you need, although you can shoot manual if you really want to by adding an additional manual controller at a cost of about £15. This is a great little camera. It's well made, it's good looking, and as part of the OM family it mounts all of the Zuiko lenses, many of which will give you some really stunning images. It's inexpensive too. A good one of these will cost between 50 and 80 pounds, which, in my view, is a real bargain. There's quite a bit of plastic used in its construction, but don't let that put you off. It's a well-made camera that's long-lived, and it's stood the test of time. There are thousands of these still in regular use today. It has a very large, 
very bright viewfinder with micro prisms to get absolute accuracy in focusing. Remember, these cameras were made for manual focusing and I find it far easier to focus manually with them than with a DSLR. This camera uses two LR44 batteries which will last about a year or so in normal use. If they run out, the camera will lock up. So if your camera locks up, check the batteries first. Like most SLRs, if the light seals haven't been changed, they'll need to be. They're made of thin foam rubber and they degrade over time. They're simple to replace though, and there's a how-to video on this channel showing how it's done. A great little camera, and some really great lenses too. Next on my list of faves is the Canon AE-1, where AE stands for Automatic Exposure. Unlike the OM-10, which shoots in aperture priority, the AE-1 shoots in shutter priority with no manual option. So when you shoot this camera, the photographer selects an appropriate shutter speed and the camera sets the aperture. It's a good system that works well. So, to use a large aperture for shallow depth of field or a small aperture for deep focus, just select the speed that gives the aperture value you want. The viewfinder is big and bright, making manual focus very easy. This camera is a favourite of photography students and deservedly so. It's very well made, it's stood the test of time and there are many thousands of these cameras still in regular use. It mounts all the Canon FD lenses and it can make some really fantastic images. This camera is very reliant on battery power and it won't work without one. It'll drain the battery pretty quickly if it's left switched on, but in normal use it should last for several months. A really nice little camera with a great auto exposure system. Inexpensive too, at around 60 to 80 pounds. Next, we have the Olympus OM-2, which is essentially an OM-1 with aperture priority auto exposure, and it shoots in all manual mode as well. This was Olympus's Pro model in the late 70s and the 80s, and it's a very nice camera indeed. It's very small, it's made almost entirely of metal, and it has a very high quality feel. It mounts all the Zuiko lenses so it can make some great images and the viewfinder is very big and bright in the Olympus tradition. For a professional camera it's not too expensive either. A good one with the 50mm 1.8 lens goes for about £120 and if you want maximum blurry background an OM2 with the 50mm 1.4 can be yours for around £150. These cameras are very durable and tend to last well, although, as with all SLRs, light seals will degrade over time and will eventually need replacing. This camera needs two LR44 batteries which, unlike the batteries for the older OM-1, are still readily available. It won't work without them though, so make sure they're good before a shoot. Shutter speeds are adjusted on a ring close to the camera body, just behind the lens mount. This layout's rather different to a conventional one, and in the place you'd usually expect to find a shutter speed dial, there's an exposure compensation dial instead. I must admit, I initially didn't like this arrangement and found it rather awkward, but with a little practice, it soon becomes second nature, and you'll only need it if you're shooting manual anyway. So, a lovely little camera, top of the range in its day and still a fantastic performer in the 21st century. If you want a professional quality camera that won't break the bank, this one's definitely worth a look. Finally, we come to a camera that must be the most modern SLR we've ever had on the Xenography channel. It's the Minolta Dynax 5000i. Production of these cameras began in the late 80s, so this is one of the last film SLRs to be released. It was the last decade when film was king, before digital technology really took off, and many manufacturers, 
Minolta in particular, were looking at ways to freshen up SLR design and to introduce new technology. And much of that technology was a precursor to that found in today's DSLRs. So, the sleek, metallic look of the 70s was out, and the somewhat larger late 80s, early 90s look was in. Manual exposure was out, and increasingly complex and accurate auto-exposure systems were in. And in this camera, autofocus too. It's a phase detection system, and it seems to work pretty well. It's not quite as quick as today's autofocus systems, but it's not far behind. The lenses for this camera have a very good reputation in terms of optical quality, and that's not too surprising. These are modern lenses, with modern glass and modern coatings, so they ought to be pretty good. The two lenses I have for this camera seem to be really nice. They've got great colour and contrast, and they're pretty sharp too. The styling is firmly rooted in the 80s, and I have to admit that personally, I really don't like the 80s look at all. What once looked modern and cutting edge now looks rather brash, loud and over-designed. But look past that, and this camera works really well. Shutter speed and aperture settings are adjusted by these two switches rather than the more traditional dials. With a little practice, they soon become second nature and they're a lot more usable than they might at first seem. In a sense, this camera, and cameras like it, represent the high point of SLR development. And you can clearly see the beginnings of the technology, the features, and the styling that would become commonplace in DSLRs a decade or so later. So if you want a really capable camera with a modern feel, this could be the one for you. They're cheap too. A good one with a decent lens shouldn't cost much more than £40. So there we are. Five great auto-exposure film cameras and one with autofocus too. Of course, there are many, many other auto-exposure cameras available. These are just models I've used and liked and can recommend. So, that's all from me for now. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope you've found it useful. Please do like and subscribe. And many thanks to everybody who's subscribed so far. As ever, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time for some more Xenography. Bye-bye for now.